Amen. So we'll continue. We're going to continue with this series. And uh, today we're going to look at, uh, at our, a little bit at, at our salvation for this morning, right? And part of the scripture reading, it says, uh, you look at it up here and it says, Oh, what manner of love, right? That's, that's, the, that's the opening of that. And if you would like, we want to see this. We're going to look at this because it says, Oh, what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us right? That we should be called the sons of God, right? Or we could say sons and daughters. Now in English, I know it's weird in English, and sometimes, so we sometimes in English will we'll add that word sons and daughters because I, I think in the original language, and kind of like, kind of like in Spanish too, there's other languages uh, that really, uh, in the language is really when you say, like for example, we say mankind, it's all inclusive, right? It's, it's men and women, you know, like in Spanish, you would say, uh, you, could, you could say, how are, your, how are your children doing? But it's usually in the masculine form, right? So if you translate it literally, it says, how are your sons doing? But includes both your sons and your daughters. Or you can just kind of, uh, or you can ask both ways, how are your sons doing and how are your daughters doing if you want to be a little bit more specific. But in the scripture, I think in this form, in a sense, it says, you know, behold what manner of love, right, that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. We want to look at that this morning. We just, I think sometimes, especially when we've been in the church for a while maybe, uh, we tend to lose the awe of that verse, the significance of that verse. Uh, we kind of forget to say, you know, that you know, we have been called not because of our goodness, not because of our greatness, not because of our abilities, not who we are, but we've been called simply because God loves us, right? He cares for us. He says he created us in his image, right? We had we'd already studied that part, and he said, you know, he created us in his image, and he says, now, even though uh, we've been in sin, he said that we are, can be... Um, be called and be made in the image of God. Okay. And we'll continue. He says, through the Spirit we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds and writes God's law of love in our hearts. And we have to remember that, right? So anything that we do, no matter what it is, what we're looking at, all of our doctrines, right? All of our doctrines uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, even in the church, sometimes we, we have to have a, a disciplinary action. It's not something that we like to do, we want to do, but it always has to be done in love. Amen. Amen. We have to look at that. We want to see that. Um, there's a, uh, uh, one of my little favorite books, Steps to Christ. I think it's that's the one uh, uh, that's in there, that quote. I, it just kind of hit me years and years ago and it stuck with me. But it said when Jesus was rebuking uh, the leadership of the church, the Pharisees, it said that there were tears in his voice. Um, you know, and so that we're admonished, these things that are loved. Because he was concerned with their salvation, right? He wasn't just uh, getting on them for breaking the rules or, or not understanding the scriptures or anything, but his heart was breaking because of, of their salvation was going to be lost. Or they wouldn't change. And that's the same thing for us today, right? And we need to care for one another and say, hey, um, God wants to write his law of love in our hearts, right? So if we, uh, if we have no other God before us, you know, one of the other commandments, we do that because of love, right? But it also says, right, honor thy father and thy mother. We ought to love, right? Right? Do not covet thy neighbor's thing. It's because of that love in a heart that comes from God. So we have to look at this, see, that God... Uh, it says, behold what manner of love. Because it's love, God is love, right? The scripture tells us. And so he's called us, and we just have to kind of maybe kind of keep that in our fresh in our minds and our hearts that we, that, that we are sitting here this morning because of what? God's love. Amen. I mean, in, in its most simplest form, in the most simplest essence, the only reason we're here this morning is because of God's love. No other reason. There's, no, there's nothing else 
uh, out there. There's not, like I said, it's not because we're good. Uh, not, and, uh, and I'm going to say, uh, not that we can offer God anything, right? He is the creator of everything. He could do whatever he wants. He could recreate whatever he needs. But his love for us is so great that he, he, he wants us to come and to worship him and to love him and to be a part of his family. And it says, right, we know about this one, and it's, this out of Ephesians 5.25, and it says, God also loved the church and gave himself for it. It says here, right, and it comes from that, you know, husbands love your wives just as Christ has loved the... I'm over here. I'm walking around and stepping on stuff. Kind of bugs me a little bit. Uh, he says, but husbands love your wives as Christ has loved, loved the church. And again, we have to look at this. Who is the church? We are, right? God didn't give himself for this building. He could probably, you know, almost, especially when he comes back right at the second coming, uh, this building is going to be destroyed, burnt, uh, and there's going to be nothing of it. And he doesn't really care too much for the building, but he cares for, for us, those of us that occupy this building. And we come week after week, right, to worship him. And we have to remember that, right, that when we come to worship, uh, and so I'm just going to take a little side note, a little sidetrack. I'm uh, talking about this, that God so loved the church, and that's us. Uh, maybe we could, uh, you know, the Sabbath, the Sabbath morning, I just want to ask the question, and this is kind of off the topic, but what's the significance of the Sabbath? Why are we here? I'm going to say in particular this morning. Maybe not so much, because the Sabbath is holy, the whole 24 hours, right? From sunset to sunset. But when we come in the morning here to come together, what, what's the importance of that? Why are we here? Okay, worship him. Amen. So I just want you to maybe uh, maybe start journaling if you want. I mean, I just, you don't have to, but hopefully we'll start journaling uh, the rest it, this week. Start journaling on the, on the good things that God has done for you. So when we come back together next week, and if they ask, say, anybody have any praises, uh, we would have a lot to praise God for, right? Because this is our time to come and, and worship him, right? And praise him and thank him for his goodness and kindness. I mean, and it's okay to have prayer requests, but really, uh, how, many us, how many of us pray all week asking for God for things? Oh, amen, amen. Six days of the week, we're saying, Lord, give me. Lord, ask. We want this, I want that. But when we come together as a group, we can come to worship and praise him and say, we praise you, God, for answering uh, these prayers, amen? And it should be a lot on our plate. Amen, because God is good, right? Is God stingy with his, uh, with his, with his blessings? No, uh-uh. And so uh, we, should, we need to recognize him for that. Amen. So we should get excited, right? We should be excited about the Sabbath. Come and worship him and glorify him and give him uh, the glory and the honor. Uh, John 14, 6. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life he's telling us right he says no man cometh unto the father but by me so we have to look we have to see this that first of all that god loves us so much that he's willing to call us his sons and daughters and that we should uh, recognize his blessings that we should recognize his goodness that we should recognize his love and then to know that god calls us his children but we can only do it through whom? Through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. It says here, we're going to look at this next one. And it says, neither is there salvation in Acts 4.12. He says, neither is there salvation in any other name. There is none other name under heaven given among men where my, we might. And I like this, this ending part of this uh, verse. It says, where we, what? Must be saved. You know, if we want to have salvation and we want to have a, 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 a surety of our salvation, we have to know it's through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. There is no other name, right? There is no other name under heaven but Jesus that we must be saved. There's no other way. Everything that we do, everything that we are, it has to be because we recognize that it's Jesus who does the saving. It's Jesus who has called us. It's Jesus who... Uh, lets us to become re uh, repentant through the, through the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus that calls us. It is Jesus that works in our lives. And it's Jesus that helps us uh, day to day in our lives to, to, to help us to praise him 
and to praise God the Father for all of these blessings that come to us, right? And we have to remember that. We just, you know, I think, like I said, sometimes we get in, the, in church after a while, after X number of years, uh, we kind of tend to forget that, right? We kind of take it for granted, right? Do we, do we do those, those kind of things? Uh, you know, uh, some of us that have been married for a long time, we, we kind of tend to take for granted our, our spouse, you know, we just know they're going to do certain things. We just kind of, hey, and, uh, and, and a lot of times, and I'm just as guilty, you know, we just don't stop to say thank you. You know, even for the simple things that they do uh, day to day. Amen? Amen? And we get like that with Jesus too, don't we? We, we kind of get uh, complacent and easy going and says, you know, we forget. There is no other name under heaven. We have to be with him. Acts chapter 2 and verses 37 to 38 says, uh, they were was being preached, they were being talked to, uh, to Peter, right? And he says, and it says, they were pricked in their heart and said, what shall we do? How can we be saved? Right, they wanted to know. They were hearing this, this awesome message by Peter, and they wanted to know what's going on. Uh, we want to have, we, they recognized that they had to be a change in their hearts. There had to be a change in their lives. And they wanted to know what, what needs to be done. And Peter said unto them, what? Repent and be baptized. Amen. Repent and be baptized. And so now a lot of us have been through that process here already. Those of us, I'm looking around, I don't think we have anybody here this morning that really has not been uh, uh, baptized. I think we're all baptized members here this morning. And we just have to, I think, I could be wrong, but I think that sometimes... Uh, we just need to keep that uh, in our minds, in our hearts, of where, why we're here week after week. And that's why I kind of wanted to switch our prayer downstairs with the meal. I was, always, I was always praying for birthdays, you know, when we were born on this earth uh, every month. But uh, I know it's a hard transition, but now I wanted to transition and say, when were we born again? You know, we have to keep that in our minds constantly and say, yes. Thank you, Lord, I was, I was born again uh, in this month. Now, how many of you remember the month you were born again? Amen, amen. You got to look at it, remember that. Put that, uh, think that sometimes, right? And uh, I forgot now, you know, because I hadn't really put that emphasis, but I forgot the exact day. I don't remember what day, but I remember it was in June. I remember it was in June in, uh, in uh, 1989. So, you know, so those are important times, right? Because really, when we get into the heavenly kingdom, why, why are we going to be able to get there? First of all, it was Jesus, but he allowed us to, to recognize, to, be, to repent, and then to what? Be baptized, which really means to be what? Be born again, right? No one can get into the heavenly kingdom unless they were born again. Amen? I mean, we have to be, and we have to stay, we have to keep that state of renewal constantly going, Right? And I know it's hard. I know it's hard to stay uh, just as excited um, about your baptism. I know it's hard to get excited and stay excited with Jesus at uh, 20, 30 years later, just as you were the first day you were baptized. But we have to do that, right? I, I think we have to try to remember that and to recognize that. Otherwise, if we don't, um, other, otherwise our religious life, if I, if I can put it in those terms, right, uh, uh, can just become routine. It just be kind of comes sort of kind of a, a kind of a habit, and it's not because of a, a sense of love and gratitude to the Father uh, for allowing us, right, to have that 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 awesome as we sang earlier that that awesome hope of His second coming, right, to be excited uh, for Him to come and to be with us and in us. And then in here, it says Colossians chapter 1 and then verses uh, 21 to 22. These are just sections of it. It's not all of those verses. But I just want to say in some of these scriptures, if you're writing some of those, you, you really should really, especially Ephesians, I think it is. Ephesians, read the, uh, all of those chapters, chapter 1 and 6. But, you know, the whole book is good. But read those and see what we're doing. But here it is. If you have your Bibles with you, you might want to... Uh, you can open your Bibles with for this verse here. I just want to share something with you. And I know I've shared this in the past, but it's something that I like to do for myself, especially in the mornings when I'm praying. Uh, we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for others. But sometimes we pray for ourselves 
And uh, this is something I like to do it from time to time and to look at this. And I'm going to read this up front, and then we're going to go back through it again as you find it in your Bibles, Colossians chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. And it says here, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he, which is God, right, Jesus Christ, reconciled, reconciled you, right, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, here's the thing I like to do about this, and then, you know, maybe help you keep this fresh. Sometimes that we have to maybe personalize this and says, and says that I at some time was alienated and an enemy in my mind by my wicked works. And now you have reconciled me in your body, through your death, and you present me holy and unblameable and reprovable in your sight. So we try to person, you know, you have to plug me in there and not make it so abstract. Somebody out there, or the church, or, you know, maybe just the apostles or the, just the prophets a long time ago. No, this is us today. This is today. At one time, before we were baptized, before we were uh, new again, Right? We were alienated. I was alienated from God. I was his enemy. But because I was his enemy because of the wicked works that were in me. Nobody else. You know, we can't, you know, in today's society, we try to blame other people, right, for the things that we do. We pray, you know, people uh, uh, get into fights or start shooting people. And it's always because, well, they did this and they did that or they shouldn't have said this or they shouldn't have done that. And I tell you, a long time ago, I worked with a uh, kind of counseling. I haven't done it in years. Uh, counseling at a women's crisis center. And uh, some of these guys would, uh, would just lose their temper, and they would hit their wives. And, well, you know, if she wouldn't have burnt the food, if she would have had my clothes ready, if they, or if the kids would, you know, it was, always, it was always somebody else's fault for them losing their temper. But in reality, whose fault was it? It was their own. It was no one else. You know, we, and I said this in the past, we can't control what other people are going to do or say. The only thing we can do is control what? How we react to that, right? And, uh, and so God is putting it on us. He said, you were at one time my enemy, but, right, because of my sacrifice, I can now present you holy and blameless. Are we holy and, un, and un, uh, blameless? No, we're, we're, we're still sinful. But he said, I can do that only because of my love for you. Again, here it is, another one. If you want to look at this one up, Romans chapter 5 and verses uh, 8 through 10. And again, I just put portions of the scripture up there. You can read all of this. But if you want to open your Bibles to this part and look at it. And, it. and it begins here, it says, But God commendeth his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and again you can plug your you can plug in i right here right you usually don't like to use i a lot because i is uh the i is the middle middle letter for sin in it but in this case we want to put i we can say for god commendeth his love towards me we can write that on there and i do that in my bible sometimes over, right over the top of that word i'll probably plug in i would do it in my bible i says for god commendeth his love towards me that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And is that re that's a really a true statement, right? Because we could say, you know, none of us here were called to God because we were saints from the beginning, right? He didn't call us, and his sacrifice wasn't made because we were already holy. He called us because we needed holiness. He called us because we needed cleansing. He called us because we needed to be renewed. And so we can say here that command, God commanded his love towards me while I was yet a sinner. You know, we have to look at these, these Bible uh, verses and just plug ourselves uh, in there. And it says, then it goes on to say, much more than being now justified by his blood, I shall be saved from wrath through him. 
right? Isn't that a wonderful promise? Isn't that wonderful? And if we look at this more often, I think we can be in more and continue to stay in our awe for Jesus and God and this work. For if I then was an enemy, right, then I was reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, I shall be saved by his life. It's me. It's personal. God touches each one of us in a personal way, and we have to look at these scriptures in that light. I think, and so, I, and it's, and so, it's kind of important that we look at these things and see where we're at. Okay, now we're just going to go over this really quick, and it says here then the three phases of sanctification according to Bible, and uh, and you know these are really studies that you can do on your own, right? Here uh, in these 30 minutes on the sermon, I'm just really giving you uh, what they call like the tip of the iceberg, right? You can get deeper. There's a lot more to the study than what I can share here with this morning. But I want you to look at this. Uh, so the first one, the number one accomplishment is the act in the believer's past or the act of God working in my life, excuse me, in the past. And sometimes we can kind of combine this and call it uh, justification, right? We are justified by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His calling, he calls us, and like we already read, since he called us and he cleansed us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemies, and we were cleansed, and now we are called. He says, behold what man of love, now that we are called the sons and daughters of God. We're called, we're, we're, we're justified. The second one is the process in the believer's present experience. And this is a tough one here because it says the process in the believer's experience. We have to have a process of sanctification. How often? Daily. Amen. Every single day. Every single day. Every day we wake up. It's the time for prayer and say, Lord, help me. Help me as I pray for myself, as I pray for others, as I read the scriptures. Help me. Uh, through your word, through the washing. Now, we, we know these scriptures, right? Through the washing of your word that I might be sanctified today when I go a step out the door, I can live for you. I can represent you, right? Because we tell the whole world that we're Christians, right? We take on Christ's name. We're Christians. And now we have to represent him out there. And hopefully that, uh, and we will, we'll let him down from time to time, won't we? Unfortunately, but we say, Lord, forgive me, help me. And then every day, we got to go through that process. And then the third one, I like this one, it says, is the result that the believer experiences at Christ's second coming. What happens to us at Christ's second coming? What was that? Well, we change, right? This mortal body will put on immortality, amen. This corruption will put on incorruption, right? We will be finally made totally 100% perfect physically. And we look at this sometimes. We talk about the physical part because of the book of Revelation is no more dying, no more tears, right? All of these things. But he's going he's to want us not only to be physically perfect, but he wants us to be spiritually perfect as well, right? He wants the culmination is to be back into the image of God, right? Just like he created Adam and Eve at the very beginning. And he says, so that's, those are those three phases of sanctification, right, that we want to look at, that we have to be in process. And we have to say, but if we're not in awe, if we're not in awe of God, if we're not in awe of being made his sons and daughters, then uh, we're not going to be in the position to ask for to help us with the sanctification process that takes, takes daily, right? It's a lifetime work. It doesn't happen from one. I wish it would, right? Oh, man. You know, how much heartache could we save ourselves and our family and friends around us if we uh, just come out of those baptismal waters all of a sudden? New creature, perfect in Christ Jesus to represent him. But, you know, we've worked, we've worked on, our, on, on our bad characters for a lot of years before we came to the Lord, and now we have to, uh, it's going to take years to overcome what we've, uh, we've worked on to do, right? Amen. We have to do that. All right, Romans 8, 16 through 17. The Spirit itself bears witness unto our spirit, so we should be in union with the Holy Spirit, right? That we are the children of God. And if children then, and this is exciting, right? The Bible here tells us in Romans, 
8, it says, Then if we are children of God, then we are heirs. And it's really interesting here. It says, Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's, a, that's an amazing statement. Because if, if we think about that, he says that we are joint heirs. You know, I mean, I don't want to overdo this thing. I don't want to go overboard, but really, here it's saying, in certain respects, in certain areas, as far as our salvation is concerned, anyways, because of Jesus, he's putting us on that same level as Jesus. He's putting on us that, that we're heirs. He said, you know, we're, Jesus, we're going to have a new earth, a new heavens, and he says, and this is going to be just as much as yours to enjoy as Jesus, as my son. Right? Amen. Amen. He said, I'm giving this to you. Your heirs. What, that, what, shouldn't that kind of get us excited? That should get us excited and on fire and say, Lord, I want to do everything possible. Right? I want to do everything I, because you promised it. Not, again, we're, we're his enemies and we're sinners, but Lord, you have promised it to us. Okay. And again, I put in my road, read, read Ephesians 1, but, you know, you can read more of it, but and then verses 6 through 7, wherein he made us, but accept it in the beloved that's God God had made me he had made me accepted in his beloved in whom we have what redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin according to the richness of his grace and his grace is because why grace covers us because we don't deserve it right we don't deserve eternal life we don't deserve to be co-heirs uh, with Jesus we don't deserve to be heirs uh, heirs with God, we don't need to deserve uh, eternal life. We don't. Need, we don't even deserve to be protected here in this life, much less eternal life. But he said, "But because of His grace, he said, all of these things can be yours, right?" And, and we have to keep that alive in our minds and in our hearts. He said, "Yes, Lord, you know." Uh, and I forgot what preacher said, but we have to have an, uh, uh, an attitude of gratitude continually, right? It's got to be ongoing. Okay, Ephesians 3.17, it says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Right, again, you know, we, we see our own weaknesses, right? But it says, by faith, Christ will dwell in my hearts that we, what, being rooted and grounded in love. And this is out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. That's the only way that change can be. That's the only way sanctification can come about if Christ, right, uses the Holy Spirit that Christ, the Holy Spirit, can dwell in our hearts, bring that change in us that we be rooted and I, I like that, that uh, thing here, and matter of fact, I got a, a poster up here, if you guys, I don't know if you've noticed it or seen it or looked at it lately uh, it's got a scripture up there on Romans but um, it said if the root is holy then the branches are a holy, the fruit, right? What comes to whatever's inside but uh, on that poster, I asked, how deep are your roots? All right, do we have deep roots? Are they going deeper or are they shallow? Right? Are they shallow roots? And it said, and then being grounded in love, the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, right, for, for one another, right? For, first of all, for God, but then for one another as well, right? And, and all of these things that we do, it has to happen because of that love. You know, if we don't have that, that, that exceeding love, for one another, exceeding love for God, the Father, uh, it's hard to, to fight those blankets in the morning, right? That's why them blankets will win, because uh, we're more interested in our own, right, in our own self, our own comfort, than we are in worshiping uh, God, right? We, uh, it's hard to get out in this in the cold weather, right, in the in the snow and the ice, uh, to worship. It's hard to get out and want to serve the community, right? We can't serve uh, the homeless. We can't visit. Uh, missing members uh, and all of these things because um, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus that has to be that has to be in there and so we got to look at this and say you know Lord God why have you saved me what what is what is your purpose in my life and we have to look at it and say behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on me, that I should be called a son or daughter of God. What is it? 
What is this awesome privilege that he's given me? And how can I use this privilege? Am I using this privilege of being co-heirs with Jesus? All right, we have to remember what Jesus did while he walked on this earth, right? Amen. Amen. So I want to challenge us this morning as we're going through the Bible, going, that we need to remember these things, right? We need to remember and cling to Jesus, to be grounded in his love and mercy, and to know that all that we do is just simply in response to what God has already done for us and in us. Amen? Amen. Let us bow our heads and we'll have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, and it's a wonderful Sabbath morning, and, and again, we thank you, and we praise you, Lord God, for, for your goodness and kindness. Lord, we thank you for this reminder, Lord God, that, that we need to be in awe of the process that you've used to call us out of the darkness and into this light, that you have called us, Lord God, that we could be prepared for your second coming, that we could be uh, remade into your image, Lord God, that we should be uh, that we should be rooted in your truth and grounded in your love, Lord God. Help us, uh, Lord God, to go through this, this sanctification process every single day of our lives, every minute of the day, Lord God. And help us not to forget, Lord God, what it took for us to have salvation. Help us not to forget the sacrifice that was made, Lord, and that we can not only be grateful for our own salvation, but that we could be so grateful that we'd be willing to share um, this love of yours with others. Lord, we ask again these blessings to be poured upon us that we can live a life in such a way that it would bring glory and honor to the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, we thank you and we praise you in his holy name.